York to participants all over the world. Um, my name is Andrea Ostheimer. I'm the executive director of the New York office of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. And it is my pleasure to welcome everybody to today's webinar co-hosted with the Counter Extremism Project on the use of cryptocurrencies and terrorism financing. Certainly those of you who know Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and the work that we are doing via our more than 100 country offices worldwide, um, those of you might wonder why a German political foundation takes up such a topic. First, as a foundation that supports democratic uh, processes globally, we see the challenges international terrorism poses for the freedom in societies, for civil and human rights. And it is particularly prevalent in countries where the absence of the state in marginalized regions has opened the doors for terrorist groupings, be it Boko Haram in Nigeria or Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines. Often in these cases, we see civic and political rights curtailed by anti-terrorism legislation established in response. As Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, we therefore analyze and address security related topics in many of our programs. Some of them like the security policy dialogue in Sub-Saharan Africa are specifically de dedicated to an engagement with the security sector, with academia, with civil society. In our work, we always understand us as a bridge builder between state and non-state actors. And it is in this context that the New York office serves as a liaison to the United Nations, to UN member states and civil society. But we do not only address issues related to peace and security. International development assistance, development financing, as well as the use of new technologies for the achievement of the sustainable development goals are equally important to us. If we pick out, for example, development financing, we will see that cryptocurrencies are able to facilitate illicit financial flows, one of the main obstacles and leakages in development financing. New technologies, artificial intelligence can foster development, but can also infringe civil rights. Digital governance, and therefore also the question how much needs to be regulated in order to safeguard rights, but also how much freedom, freedom does the private sector need in order to be innovative, to be competitive um, in service for development? These are questions that are central for our work. And just end of last year, we coordinated with the CAS offices worldwide, a series of multi-stakeholder dialogues on digital governance. And I guess these sh short elaborations on our work show how today's topic ties into the overall agenda of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. And at that point, I would like to thank particularly the Counter Extremism Project and particularly also Hans Jakob Schindler and David Ibsen and their teams for this joint initiative and also the good cooperation we have beyond in New York and in Berlin. Dr. Hans Jakob Schindler will present today the study undertaken by CEP and Berlin Risk on cryptocurrencies as threats to public security and counterterrorism, risk analysis and regulatory challenges. And um, it is my pleasure also to present to you Hans Jakob Schindler, who is a former German government official specialized in counterterrorism. He currently serves as the senior director of the Counter Extremism Project in New York and Berlin. And from 2013 to 2018, he was a member and also coordinator of the ISIL, Al Qaeda, and Taliban sanctions monitoring team of the United Nations Security Council. As a coordinator, he regularly briefed the members of the Security Council on the global terrorism threat, and he was responsible for the development of global counterterrorism sanctions. Prior to this appointment, he worked also as a consultant in the private industry in London, and he held official positions in Germany as well as in the German embassy in Iran. So with this brief introduction, I would also like to hand over to Hans uh, in order for the presentation of the study, but also for the kind of housekeeping rules that we have established. Over to you, Hans. Thank you so much uh, also from me to the CAS office in New York, and of course, Ms. Ostheimer and Ms. Frau Sabitzer to, for the co-organization of this event. Uh, as you already said, my name is Hans Schindler. I'm the senior director of CEP. Thank you for taking all of you. Thank you for taking the time um, in the morning, if you're in the US, in the afternoon, if you're in Europe, for taking part in this webinar. 
Um, there are a few technical remarks, and I see one participant already figured out what I'm gonna about to say. Um, since this is a webinar format, all your microphones and cameras are disabled automatically. This is the only way to run a webinar. However, that doesn't mean we want you to be silent. So instead of using the chat function, please use the Q&A function. And you see this if you go on your screen to the bottom bar on the far uh, uh, right side, there's a, a little icon called Q&A. Or if you are in Germany using a German version, it's called F and A, F and A. Uh, you click on this and then you can type in your questions there. Um, they have, you have two options here. One is to ask like uh, Mr. Uh, Clay is, uh, have already done. You can ask under your name, but also please feel perfectly free to ask a question anonymously. You don't have to identify yourself if you don't wish to. Um, the presentations um, of uh, this afternoon, i.e. the presentation of the report as well as the presentation of my good friend and colleague Yahya Fanusi are going to be recorded, but these are going to be the only recorded parts of this uh, webinar. We will make videos of the presentations and then you can find them on the CEP YouTube, CEP Germany YouTube channel. So hence the ability to also, of course, ask anonymous questions. The Q&A session is not going to be recorded and we will conduct those under Chatham House rules. Um, just a very brief uh, reminder of what that means. Uh, you can absolutely, and please do, uh, publicly refer, refer to this webinar. Both Ms. Osheimer and me would be very glad if you do, including on social media. But please, uh, for the Q&A sections, do not attribute any particular issue, any particular statement to anyone asking a question or um, um, answering the, the question. So in, in, a, in a way, please keep those rules for the Q&A section. Um, very brief introduction for those of you who have not yet engaged with CEP. Uh, CEP is a transatlantic organization who, since 2014, has been working both in North America as well as in Europe on countering extremism in all its forms, from all the way to right-wing extremism, to Islamist terrorist individuals and organizations. Since October 2019, we do have now a separate legal European entity in Germany, registered in Germany, and a permanent office in Germany. We have three basic work streams. Um, we work on classic CT issues, including counterterrorism financing issues. We have a work stream looking at PVE, CVA, CVE related issues. And there we will have in a couple of weeks on the 3rd of June, a very interesting webinar that I all like to invite you to, to look at the rehabilitation programs for released terrorists, both in the US as well as in Germany and at, in the European Union with uh, eminent experts uh, in the field. That should be a very interesting event to attend. And third, we work on all cyber-related issues, i.e. the activities of extremists and terrorists online, including how to best disrupt their ability to misuse these services via smart and effective regulations. And in a way, today's topic, uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, financing of terrorism, um, is combining work worth streams um, one and three of CEP in one neat um, topic. As was already mentioned, our cooperation partner for the production of the report and the actual authors of the report was Berlin Risk, a political and financial consultancy headquartered in Berlin, hence the name. And I'm very happy that uh, the senior managing partner of Berlin Risk, uh, Ms. Hanley, uh, Ms. Jennifer Hanley Giersch, is able to join us today. Um, and we'll give you now a little bit of an introduction of how this report came about and what Berlin Risk is about. Jennifer, over to you. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Hans, for that uh, kind introduction. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Andrea Ostheimer and Konrad Annor Stiftung, also for the introduction. Just a couple of words about uh, Berlin Risk. Um, so uh, we're a risk and compliance advisory firm founded in Germany 12 years ago, serving private and public sector clients globally. Our partners have between 15 and 25 years experience. We're all certified anti-money laundering, fraud and sanction specialists, active on advisory assignments and investigations globally. Our mandate is to support organizations in minimizing legal and financial risks whilst protecting their reputation. Um, our insights and intelligence also help organizations to operate successfully in high risk and in transparent environments. 
As you can see here on the slide as well in the top right hand corner, um, there's another logo which is BCF Partners. This is a consortium of European advisory firms which is quite unique in this sector which was co-founded by Berlin Risk in 2015 to serve European multilateral development banks uh, advising them on risk and compliance uh, topics. And now I want to say a couple of words about uh, the interesting genesis of this uh, study or the Entstehungsgeschichte as we might uh, say in German. So besides being based on this uh, great collaboration between Berlin Risk and CEP, um, the first uh, stones uh, laid on Berlin Risk side were already in 2017, the first article published uh, following the adoption at the time of the fourth EU anti-money laundering directive in 2016, which for the first time brought virtual currency exchange platforms and custodian wallet providers into scope of EU anti-money laundering legislation. And since then, the discussion has evolved quite rapidly. And we now face a consultation process around EU risk factor guidelines, which have been expanded well beyond the initial scope to provide also regulation of crypto to crypto exchanges. Uh, and we might, in fact, at the EU level, see a regulation uh, as opposed to a directive being uh, implemented for anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing purposes in the not too distant future. The FATF, Financial Action Task Force, has also set a clear agenda for the topic, which also provides a useful framework for the discussion like the one we're having today. Um, via our industry association, here the Association of Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, we have a Germany chapter and we hosted various events to discuss the financial crime risks, including counter-terrorism uh, uh, counter and cryptocurrencies. And during these discussions, I suppose the design for the study was uh, born. Uh, Berlin Risk and CEP engaged in a wide range of stakeholder consultations also over the course of the past 12 months. Uh, we spoke to blockchain experts, terrorist financing experts, to fintechs operating in the crypto space. Uh, and we had various interviews with experts, including also uh, Mr. Panusi, who's going to speak today, uh, and various uh, focus group uh, discussions. We had a very fruitful event, which took place at the end of October last year in cooperation with the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, uh, SVP. Uh, in uh, German, which advises the German government and Bundestag amongst, other, uh, uh, amongst others on international politics and foreign and security policy. Now, although the study has evolved in a very dynamic period in terms of these regulatory developments, which posed uh, a distinct challenge to my colleague, Dr. Eisenman, the author of the study, uh, I have been told by some uh, experts uh, here that the study is in fact uh, uh, balanced and I think this balanced output uh, is uh, really thanks to uh, all of the stakeholders that we were able to consult. So if any of you are on the call today, the people that we spoke to in an interview, thank you very much uh, for uh, all the contributions. Uh, and now without further ado, let me hand over to uh, Dr. Schindler, who will present the results of the studies, and I look forward to engaging in a discussion later on. Thank you very much. Let me just share the presentation. So, well, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for, for this, and thanks again from my side to Berlin Risk, Jennifer and Daniel, and everyone working there on the great work of the study that I have the privilege to present today uh, in this webinar. Um, I'll uh, present the study in four major parts. I'll first uh, look at a brief description of what the cryptocurrency technology actually means in the view of risks for any money laundering and counterterrorism financing efforts. Then I'll look at some examples of how cryptocurrencies have been misused so far by terrorist groups and individuals, but only from a very strategic sense, because I know Yahya Vanusi is going to give some more concrete and very illustrative examples. Um, then I'll look in the third part on the developing regulatory framework. And as Jennifer already pointed out, there is a lot uh, that is going on at the moment and um, has already been quite a, a few achievements. And then lastly, I look at the four recommendations that the reports make, mainly towards the German government. But these recommendations are framed in a way that they're applicable to a lot of governments within Europe, but also outside Europe. So let me start with the question of what is cryptocurrency and how and why may they be actually 
uh, at risk of being misused. First of all, uh, let me state that we decided for this report to take an eclectic approach. Technology is never inherently good or inherently bad. It's just you can do it, uh, you can use technology for good things or for bad things. Um, therefore, it's really important to look at the particular risk profile of cryptocurrencies as far as uh, uh, counter, uh, countering the financing of uh, terrorism is concerned and to figure out how it can be misused and then to argue what should be done. The basic idea of cryptocurrencies, of course, is to create a value, uh, value storage and particular value transfer mechanism that is uncontrolled and unconnected to central banks or any kind of government regulatory authority. Um, in a way, it is, as one author uh, uh, puts it and as quoted in the study, as an ideology disguised, ideology disguised as technology. Because behind a lot of the philosophy of a lot of the, of part of the cryptocurrency uh, community is the idea that any involvement of uh, the state or central bank or governments leads to politicization of the financial market and therefore distorts a free market mechanism. And therefore you should have an alternative that is unconnected to governments. And the key features that are necessary for this technology, and I'm not uh, trying to, to criticize that, is the combination of um, protection of uh, user identity on anonymity and quasi-transparency on the blockchain because you as a user need to protect your identity because all your financial transactions are going to be publicly recorded in the blockchain, i.e. the distributed ledger technology, and everyone can see what transactions you make. So the only way to protect your financial um, situation is by protecting your identity. So it is a necessary feature of that. Um, only if both are there, the anonymity of the user and uh, the, 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 uh, the transparency of the transaction, does peer-to-peer -peer transactions work? Because how can I trust my counterpart that he actually transfers the value or has the value he says he would have if I do not have a transaction history to look at? Um, the good thing was that this technology is still fairly difficult. Um, it is fairly prone to theft and the report outlines some major incidents that occurred in the last couple of years. Therefore, there's been a rise in, in an industry of intermediaries, exchanges, wallet providers, uh, trading platforms. And that's good for regulation. I'm going to get to this when I come to the part of the regulation. Currently, of course, the name that everyone knows um, is Bitcoin. It is the dominant cryptocurrency, but by no means the only cryptocurrency in existence. But currently, Bitcoin holds around 67%, according to the latest data, of the market capitalization. And because it's so long standing, and because it has such a great rate of adoption, unfortunately, Bitcoin is also the currency that is mostly connected to illicit transactions. One expert uh, assumed it's going to be around 90% of all illicit transactions in cryptocurrency that involve Bitcoin. What are the basic challenges for AML CFT? That's, of course, is the anonymity, anonymity of the user. So just very quickly for those who are not really familiar with uh, AML versus CFT, in any money laundering, you always have two chances. You can find out you're dealing with a money launderer or you can see on the pattern of transactions. So the classic placement, layering and integration, whether you're actually dealing with a criminal or nefarious actor. Because the funds in money laundering are always of criminal origin, drug dealing, theft, fraud, tax evasion. So in a way, um, the money laundering is only necessary to try to disguise the criminal origin of the funds. In counterterrorism financing efforts, however, the identity of the transactors, i.e. the one who, who sends and the one who receives, are of key importance because most likely, and in most cases, uh, I mean, apart from you know, the, the weird situation of ISIL you know, running illegal oil production operations, the funds for terrorism financing are usually uh, from legitimate means, donations, savings, people, uh, uh, money that people give. So, you will not see the traditional you know, triad of, of, of criminal behavior or criminal patterns in counterterrorism financing. So the identity is key here. Now, some will argue that this is all nonsense. You have a blockchain, you can see all the transactions, you have blockchain analysis technology where you can link the transactions back to individual wallets. This is all true. However, those linking processes only work with a mathematical certainty. So you do not have evidence that the transaction is linked to a particular wallet, which is uh, very difficult if you then want to prosecute. In addition, uh, you don't have a guarantee that it's going to work. 
that you can actually link it to a wallet. It, it does require actually a lot of technology and a little bit of luck in order to, 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 to link this to particular wallets. And so you do have still have a know your customer, a KYC challenge um, with a cryptocurrency, despite the alleged pseudonymity, i.e. The, the quasi transparency of the transactions on the blockchain and for the compliance processes that some exchanges already run, unless you regulate this space, you have no way of telling whether those compliance processes are appropriate, are effective, are fulfilling a certain standard. No regulation, no standards. Secondly, by using mixers and tumblers, which is an additional service in the transaction, which then enables you not only to anonymize yourself, but also anonymize your transactions because these mixers and tumblers break up your transaction of a fraction of a Bitcoin into smaller fractions of cryptocurrencies, and reassemble them for other transactions. So it becomes next to impossible, even by using blockchain analysis, to actually trace a transaction back to a particular wallet. And the use of increasing use of privacy coins, coins in addition, uh, in difference to Bitcoin, that uh, uh, um, allow an even greater protection of the uh, identity of the users by even encrypting the wallets. So with Bitcoin, you don't know who it is, but at least you can see what is going on in the wallet. With privacy coins like Monero, for example, you don't even see what's going on in the wallet. All of these things make it very, very complicated for in particular CFT uh, processes. And last but not least, but in my opinion, equally significant, even if you understand that it's a nefarious actor, even if you see that this is a nefarious action that finances terrorism, as long as the wallet is not in a jurisdiction that is regulated, there is no way you can uh, seize the funds, stop the funds, or freeze the funds. So you, you, there's nothing you can do. In a way, this situation actually reverses the risk balance of counterterrorism financing as far as fundraising is concerned. Previously, with fiat currencies, as soon as the fundraising campaign became public, it stopped because funds could be frozen, people could be held accountable for having donated to a terrorist organization. With cryptocurrencies, it's actually good for the terrorism finance if it becomes public, because then the public publication of that fundraising campaign enables many more people to fund them or donate without anyone running any significant risks of being discovered or the, the funds being frozen. So it is actually the complete reverse of the risk uh, uh, profile that we had in classic counterterrorism finance funds raising campaigns. Now, this was all theoretical. Has there ever been any case that terrorist organizations actually tried to use cryptocurrencies? And the answer is there is still limited data, but there has been a consistent stream of cases at least since 2014, minimum with the advent of ISO. With ISO, we actually have now an unfortunate teenager in prison in the United States for the next 11 years because in 2014, he wrote a handbook for ISIL on how to use crypto, uh, cryptocurrencies, in particular Bitcoins, and how to fund the organization via that. So there was clearly from the get-go of ISIL becoming a big organization, a clear interest, at least of some of its members, to explore what could be done with this new technology. The cases that have been discovered, and, and Yahya will elaborate a little bit more in detail, have been mainly fundraising campaigns, and it's unclear how much funds were actually raised, but at least it shows an interest. What is worrying, however, is that in the last couple of years, we have seen, as you would expect, terrorists learn as well, a technical learning curve. The simplest one was a Hamas campaign that was first run uh, via Bitcoin wallets by an exchange in the United States. Obviously, very quickly, uh, Hamas found out that if you run such a fundraising campaign in a regulated environment, i.e. a regulated exchange, that's not the ideal way to do this because then you have already, you know, uh, services looking at your wallet, attempts to seize your, your assets. So they simply move from a regulated US uh, jurisdiction to an unregulated uh, uh, exchange in a different jurisdiction. So simple learning. But what is more worrying is that there is also a development in use of new technologies. So while it was clear in one fundraising campaign that it's useful to put your Bitcoin wallet address on the public announcement that you fundraise. That, however, also enables everyone, including specialized agencies, to monitor your wallet to see how much money you can actually raise. So in one fundraising campaign, at least so far, um, they have now in struck out the address of the, of, the, of the wallet and actually put a QR code in. And if you scan that QR code, it uh, um, generates a random individualized wallet address that is not on the blockchain for you as the donor. 
That means anyone wanting to monitor that wallet now needs to first and foremost donate to the terrorist organization, which is not exactly something that uh, intelligence agencies would be very eager to do. So there is a bit of a worrying development and we've seen the first couple of uh, announcements for fundraising in privacy coins. So please don't use Bitcoins, try to use Monero announce. So there is a continuing technical learning curve. And finally on this issue, um, at least one company claims they have uh, obtained evidence that in 2019, during the Easter Sunday bombing attacks in Sri Lanka, if you remember multiple attacks with over a dozen IEDs all over Sri Lanka, um, that part of this attack was financed by using Bitcoin. So there is clearly in, a there there. What is the regulatory uh, uh, framework now and, and how is it developing? Um, frankly, politically speaking, um, it really took off with the discussion about stable coins. I'm not going to address stable coins in this presentation in great length. There is a lot of uh, the, what stable coins are and how they function and why um, in the report. Uh, stable coins, however, because they are centrally organized, so it's not a, a network controlled uh, currency, but it's a centrally controlled currency, are uh, unlikely to be very interesting for terrorist organizations because why would you want to go to some centrally controlled? However, um, if projects like Libra would finally take off, and you know, every month they seem to be one step closer to actually taking off, it would mean that you have a much greater adoption rate of cryptocurrency technology globally. That will also very likely lead to a greater adoption rate of other cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoins, including privacy coins. That will lead to the development of a market where you can actually buy goods online with cryptocurrencies. Already you can buy your house in California, you can buy some cars in Texas, you can book your entire holiday in Iran on cryptocurrencies. So if this is now ever not longer a 100, 200 million RR people using it, but a billion, two billion, three billion, you will see many more uh, businesses at, uh, being able and willing to accept Bitcoins or other cryptocurrencies. So the adoption rate is the problem with stable coins, but was also the political impetus, impetus for regulation. In very general terms, as the report outlines, the focus at the moment is on the fiat to cryptocurrency exchange. So in order to get your first cryptocurrency, somehow you need to get your US dollars, your euros, your other currency exchange into cryptocurrencies at exchanges. And it is these intermediaries which are the focus of regulatory efforts at this point at the FATF and in the European Union. And the essential thinking is, you're acting like a financial institution, guess what, you now are a financial institution and all the AML and CFT rules that apply to the financial industry now equally apply to you. Since 2018, the FATF has grown uh, has demonstrated a growing interest, FATF, the global regulatory uh, body for the financial industry, <clears throat> a growing interest in this topic and issued the first guide in 2018, renewed this in 2019 to be implemented until next month, so in a couple of weeks globally. So let's see where we stand then when it's evaluated. Um, it also introduced the wire transfer rule, i.e. if you have a transaction from one exchange to another cryptocurrency exchange, both exchanges need to know the identity of both sides of the transaction, i.e. who is the sender and who is the receiver. Um, and gave some KYC guidance, so when do you need to identify your customers? Minimum you need to identify the customers that are transacting more than a thousand euros or, 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 or US dollars in a transaction, or if you have any suspicion that some nefarious action is going on, you need to identify your customers. On the EU side, as Jennifer already said, with AMLB5, um, which was transposed into national law in Europe until January 2020. The European Union has done similar things to what the uh, FATF has asked. It extended the MLCFT platform to virtual currency and uh, wallet providers. Um, it classified the crypto custodity business, as the German law uh, calls it now, as a financial service, means everything equally applies. There's mandatory user identification, i.e. KYC, you're supposed to man monitor all transactions with unusual patterns or transactions that don't seem to follow any economic or legal purpose. Um, and they are supervised now by financial regulatory authorities in Germany is the BaFin. There was of course initial resistance from the industry saying this is precisely what this is not supposed to be. You're not supposed to collect user data and identify people. We don't even have a possibility to communicate with the other exchanges to exchange the identities 
um, uh, to fulfill the wire transfer rule, you're just basically misunderstanding what this all means. However, now after the first couple of consultations and public private partnerships, there's now a growing understanding, at least in significant parts of the industry, that regulations make sense because it helps them to defend their services from being misused for criminal purposes or terrorism financing. And so they have now, a couple of weeks ago, just uh, agreed on a messaging standard similar to SWIFT, so they can actually exchange identities of users to fulfill the wire transfer. Last but not least, the four recommendations. Um, important ideas. So number one, European governments should proceed in parallel, while on the one hand, as Jennifer said, there is a public consultation now of the Financial Stability, Financial Services and Capital Markets Union, usual easy name of the European institution, FISMA is the acronym, um, to create a specific regulatory framework for cryptocurrencies. And uh, Jennifer, myself, uh, a, a colleague from FISMA and the other experts will discuss this issue on the uh, 10th of June in a webinar. You will all get an invitation and be looking forward, hopefully, to see you again. Um, but European regulations take time. Minimum a couple of years, at best five years before it's done, at really ideal circumstances. Um, what you need to understand, technology develops, uh, which means you have to, in the meantime, really look at your national risks on, on AML and CFT and cryptocurrencies and potentially adjust because AML D5 is a directive which means any national government can go beyond this. They cannot just go below the standard. So if the national governments see a spike in AML and CFT related risk, they can do tighter regulations now. And we would say, uh, if you see the need, please do. Uh, second is we need to increase the level of experience in existing government authorities. It's wonderful that these uh, are now regulated all over Europe by financial regulatory bodies, but these traditionally have been geared to regulate fiat currency transactions. Um, the cryptocurrency sector is a completely different technical beast. You need a different set of expertise and most crucially, you need a different set of technical capabilities such as blockchain analysis to actually regulate the sector. So we need a, a new capability and capacity building within the regulatory authorities should the regulations be supervised in any effective way. Um, authorities must require, is the third recommendation, crypto providers to develop relevant uh, compliance experiences and process and auditing rules. Um, the cryptocurrency sector, as outlined uh, uh, in the beginning, was not built with compliance in mind. There was no need uh, uh, when it was, uh, there was not seen the need of compliance. Now, compliance is this flash word in the financial industry. Everyone wants to be compliant, better compliant, first in market to be compliant, best in market to be compliant. No one actually says it's very difficult to be compliant. Just think about customer identification. You no longer have a customer physically walking into anything. We talked about an online business. So you need to see the already existing online verification, identity verification tools that some major banks or credit card companies are already using with automatic detection of identity cards, which is difficult if you think about globally, because there is no real global identity card standard. There's a passport standard, but not an identity standard, identity card standard. So all of these things need to be worked through and therefore auditing of competent regulatory authorities with the right expertise, combining technical expertise with compliance experience is crucial for the industry because only then are they able to build up um, good processes. So auditing actually in this situation is helpful. And lastly, um, it's not yet done. Right, so anonymous transactions are still possible because we have a next development of technology. Peer-to-peer -peer transactions without an immediate intermediaries. Non-custodial wallets and non-custodial exchanges is the, are the technical terms. This is a very new technology, super complicated, risky to use as an individual, but in development. And one uh, uh, cryptocurrency trader that we talked to said, well, in the medium to long run, that is gonna be very user-friendly and that's gonna become the new standard and put me out of work. Now, remember, this is the online sector. So when we asked him what is medium to long term, he, me he said three to five years. Now, as I said, that's the best circumstances that you're going to get some regulation on today's issues passed in a national or let alone in the European context. So we need to start thinking what we're going to do with this new techni technical developments are already there, not yet fully adopted, but already there and how are we gonna regulate those? Because there's no more an intermediate that you can obligate to do anything. Every single user potentially is their own bank, is their own obligated entity. 
do you want that? Do you want to outlaw that? Do you want to monitor this by the regulatory authorities directly or not? There are a lot of regulatory questions that need to be uh, you know, asked now and discussed now. So these are the main points of the report. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to your questions later on. And I saw there's already quite a few in the Q&A section. Please continue to use the Q&A window um, to, to post your questions. You will get the report here on the right, either via our Twitter account, CEP Germany, or then you can see also a link to the report and the video of today's presentations on our CEP Germany YouTube account. Thank you so much. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Hans, um, for this very brief overview on a very rich and informative study. Um, you highlighted in your presentation the, the basic, I would call them complex challenging challenges for anti-money laundering and uh, countering the financing of terrorism. You also highlighted um, the persistent interest of terrorist organizations as well as the kind of developing regulatory frameworks that are still in a very nascent stage. Um, we have um, actually uh, attributed a bit of time for questions for clarification. And I would like, besides of all the kind of questions we have already been um, uh, listed, I would like to give also the audience the opportunity to ask for clarifications. I actually have one which I would qualify as a clarification. Um, do we know, do we have a grasp of the percentage of illicit transactions actually conducted um, with Bitcoins, with cryptocurrencies? Look, I mean, it's hard to put a, a figure on it because, I mean, the, the nature of illicit transactions is that they are illicit. So you can only look at the cases that actually became public and they were prosecuted. Um, clearly, um, the experts in literature state uh, that uh, if you're buying your arms these days, right, you're actually using cryptocurrencies if you are a criminal of any consort. We've outlined a couple of cases of terrorism financing that's been going on. Certainly, it's not the majority of, I mean, some would argue because it's so intransparent at the moment, you could easily say it's the majority because no one can prove you wrong of all these transactions. And why would anyone use this technology other than as an investment tool if it doesn't have anything to hide. Because what it does is what any bank does. It transacts money from one place to the other one, including across state borders. The one kicker, of course, is speed and costs, right? So uh, I've heard from one of the traders that he was able to transact, I think it was 50 million US dollars equivalent in cryptocurrencies uh, within a minute and at a cost of $3.50. Um, that's not exactly what a bank would take as far as time is concerned and as far as... Uh, uh, costs are concerned. So, but that's the main practical advantage today that you have at the moment with cryptocurrencies. So it's hard to put a, a total figure on it, but it's certainly prevalent uh, uh, in, in kidnapping, in arms trading, uh, in, in um, as uh, Yahya will point out, maybe in sanctions eversion as well. And we've seen cases in cryptocurrencies for terrorist organizations. But whether it's 50%, 90%, or 10%, that's really impossible to say at this point. Okay, no, thank you very much. Um, and I think that's a good point also to hand over to Yahya Fanusi, um, who is an adjunct fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies and also a senior adjunct fellow at the Center for, a New, American, for New American Security. His research focuses on the national security implications of cryptocurrencies, particularly blockchain technologies and other technological innovations. Uh, Yahya spent seven years as both an economic and counterterrorism analyst in the CIA. He also spent three months in Afghanistan providing analysis support to senior military officials. After his service in government, Yahya joined a small consulting firm where he also led a team of analysts working on multi billion dollar recovery efforts involving a global corruption ring. Yahya is a regular contributor at Forbes and also regular contributes analysis to the media, both in print and broadcast, including CNN and Fox News. He has also testified multiple times before the US Congress, uh, particularly on illicit financial issues. And Yahya, we are looking very much forward to hear and listen to your wealth of expertise and experience on the topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I would also like to say before 
before moving on, um, Hans, thank you so much for the overview. In fact, you've made my job much easier. Um, and I, I found the report to be really, and your, your, your review of it, a, a very good comprehensive um, look at this, uh, of this issue, at this issue, which I've been dealing with for the past several years, but um, the report does a great job of distilling the complex regulatory um, and risk issues into a very um, concise, easy to, 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 to digest package. So, so thank you very much for that. And I'm planning to really just maybe complement your presentation and the report with some, some examples. Uh, and then I'll touch on maybe some of the, the emerging risks and the emerging innovations that, that I think we're seeing, that, that, that I've been observing. Um, I'd like to make the key focus of this, this presentation experimentation, experimentation and uh, uh, adaptation. That's really what I've noticed when we talk about terrorists using cryptocurrencies. We can talk about other actors, um, but with terrorists, we, we've really observed an, an experimentation phase, I'd say. And, and the thing that is concerning is the adapting, uh, which I think you've, you've pointed out. Um, and I also want to echo your statement that technology is is, is neutral, right, when it comes to crime. Uh, obviously, there could be another conversation about some of the efficiencies and some of the positive, uh, some of the benefits of this technology. Uh, so I don't want to discount that, but through the lens of, of security, through the lens of looking at terrorist financing, that's what, what I'm focused on. And that's why, um, uh, you know, uh, th that's why we're going to focus on these issues. So, uh, one point I always start with is when we're thinking about terrorists using cryptocurrencies, just understand that the learning curve and the adoption, it really reflects what's happening in the broader society, right? We're thinking about it, 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 it terrorists, in essence, are part of the general population. So they're going to find out about this technology, they're going to start using it, um, it's going to grow, become more adopted in the same way that it gets adopted in the, in the general population. So I just want everyone to under, understand that this is not something that is unique to terrorists. They're just mirroring the broader adoption. But what I'll do in this presentation is we'll focus on some of those early attempts of crowdfunding, uh, talk about the learning curve, which Hans has, has mentioned, um, touch a little bit more on the regulatory challenges, and end with just a few points of these new emerging risks that come, not just from crowdfunding, but from some other uses of cryptocurrency technology. But I'll start with, you know, let's have the baseline so, so it's clear. Terrorists always are looking for anonymity and ease of use. And you know, most uh, often when we talk about terrorist financing, uh, people will say, well, look, cash is what people want. Cash is king. Cash is still king, right? Obviously, uh, if there's gonna be a choice, uh, you know, it, most criminals want to use cash um, over, over even cryptocurrencies, right? But there are some benefits to cryptocurrencies in terms of cross-border transactions. But I just wanna keep, keep it clear. Because uh, when you think about the complications, the challenges, even for terrorists, right, they're all, they, they're, even the tools that they use and the way that they adapt, it's because they want to keep things anonymous and they want to keep things simple. So let's go back to that 2014, Hans, with, that you mentioned. When you mentioned a uh, supporter of ISIS or ISIL uh, pushing Bitcoin, this is actually a snapshot. This is that young teenager who, um, in those early days of, of ISIS and in the relatively early days of Bitcoin, he was a, a computer science specialist, uh, a, you know, a young, young student, and he did upload a guide. He was encouraging supporters of ISIS to get into Bitcoin and, and it pr produce this handbook, which showed how you could purchase cryptocurrencies anonymously, purchase Bitcoin anonymously. Um, now we don't know exactly how effective this was, but it, it's a bit of a signpost, you know, it, it's or a milestone. It shows exactly when um, supporters of the group were thinking outside the box, right? We're thinking of ways to help move money from throughout the world to. Uh, the ISIS battlefield. And so this is uh, an important, uh, important uh, sort of milestone, even if we're not sure exactly what it, what it uh, gained. Uh, but really this, you know, crowdfunding, this is a use case that we can talk a lot about 
probably because this is what we, where we have evidence. We have some examples that we can point to. There's a lot of other activity that could be happening that we just don't have public insight into. But the crowdfunding campaigns provide um, some, some good data and allow us to provide some judgments about where we think things are going. Now these, uh, on the screen here, these shots are of the, uh, the Hamas campaign that Hans mentioned earlier, the Al-Qassam Al uh, brigades. And I just show this up here to show, right? They had infographics, that middle graphic in the middle there is about learning about Bitcoin. I mean, it's just a basic um, how-to. What is Bitcoin? What is the exchange rate? Um, how to have a wallet? Is it anonymous, right? So these are just uh, almost uh, info tools and, and tutorial tools that, uh, that Hamas put out for its Bitcoin campaign that was last year. And we're going to come back to that, but I just wanted to show those graphics. And you'll see in most cases, well, in all cases, I am uh, obscuring the cryptocurrency address where you see that red stripe there, uh, because obviously we don't want to give anyone, uh, uh, we don't want to, to, to provide anything that could uh, lead people to, to actually donating uh, to these campaigns, obviously. Um, so, uh, but I like I like to take you back to a campaign that I was following several years ago um, in 2016. This was a campaign that I think started in in 2015, uh, and and my shorthand for it is the Jahizona campaign because um, their sort of tagline was Jahizona uh, equip us. And this was a group um, that was it was a campaign that was being run by the Ibn Tamiya Media Center, which is a group a a a group of um, that represents the Mujahideen Shura Council, which is a consortium of uh, jihadist groups in the Gaza Strip. And they were raising money on social media for weapons, uh, you know, ammunition, and this was ongoing. And this is one of their social media graphics uh, from the sort of 2015-2016 era. But something came up in 2016 which is I was noticing, um, uh, I saw a report about them soliciting Bitcoin and what they were doing. They were going on Twitter and other social media channels. And here you have a graphic. This is their same Equip Us campaign, but at the right corner, right bottom hand corner of the graphic, a QR code for Bitcoin. Um, so this was, uh, this was the first moment that I had noticed that a verified uh, uh, you know, terrorist group, a designated terrorist group in the U.S., uh, the Mujahideen Shura Council is designated. Um, we knew, we were pretty confident this was their social media channel because it wasn't new. We could see that they had been uh, raising, that they had been uh, posting on social media through this channel. So, so we were clear that this was a designated terrorist group and they were asking for Bitcoin. So this wasn't just um, suggesting it, this is them actually reaching reaching out. And that's important to note because up until this time, uh, there were lots of times when maybe people would post on social media and say they were raising for a terrorist group, but you had to determine if maybe they were just a scammer. Um, you know, unfortunately, you have some people who would scam and say they're raising money for ISIS, but it's someone totally unrelated because they're trying to, you know, they're just a fraudster. So you have fraudsters even trying to defraud uh, the terrorists. But this was a verifiable campaign. And the thing was, why this was an interesting, as someone who, um, you know, looks at, had been looking at terrorist groups, this was the first time that there was an actual record that I could look at this campaign. Why? Because they had a Bitcoin address and they were actually, uh, and I could use a blockchain browser to look at this uh, address to see how much they had rained, ra uh, raised. And spoiler alert, they had not raised much money. <laughs> they raised at the time about, you know, $600 worth worth of Bitcoin. But what we were able to do is we were able to trace, we were able to look at the transactions using this open source information on the blockchain, right? These browsers just allow you to track the transactions, see the history, see where they have come. And we were able to actually look and see that these, um, that two of the transactions that ended up in the Jahazona uh, account came from an exchange called BTCE. And BTCE, is or was uh, one of these really unregulated exchange. It was an exchange that you could pretty much sign up and you could say your name is Mickey Mouse 
and they would give you an account and you could start using their platform. You could start buying Bitcoin, you could start moving Bitcoin. And BTCE became known as really a money laundering uh, 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 exchange, an exchange where you could uh, launder money very easily. And so it made sense that someone that would designate, that would donate to this designated organization would use BTCE. So we were able to, if we as independent researchers, right, this was me working at a think tank, right, not working in government. So if I was able to track the transactions and see that they came from BCE, you could assume that it would also help law enforcement, help government agencies really do the same, who would then have their own um, legal power, perhaps, to talk to an exchange. Now, in this case, it was BTCE, which had a shadowy sort of um, his, uh, history and ownership structure. It was really unclear where they were based. But, uh, but, but what this means is that the blockchain anal analysis would allow you to find the custodian, to find the intermediary exchange, you typically where you could uh, inter intervene and interdict and perhaps find out the identity, identity and maybe even freeze those wallets. Let's move forward to 2017. This is another interesting case because of how public it was, the Al Sadaqa campaign. And this was a group that uh, sort of sprouted up. It described itself as a, a charity or organization uh, that was um, supplying and helping fighters in Syria. And this came up because they were noticed um, campaigning on um, uh, media channels, telegram channels, social media channels that were aligned with Al Qaeda groups or Al Qaeda affiliated groups uh, in Syria. And so this campaign, you see they have their uh, another infographic and then again asking at the very bottom of the screen there, donate here with Bitcoin. So they had their own Bitcoin address. And what this did is it allowed us to actually look at the campaign. And again, here are just some of the images, right, um, that they would post, infographics. And they said that they were looking for uh, uh, funds in order to reinforce their camp. Uh, everything from storage facilities, kitchen facilities, toilet facilities. And at the time, they said they just wanted $750 for this specific project. And you can see, again, there was also graphics supporting people or encouraging people to support them um, as part of a duty. It was interesting because this group also had video. They were, again, very public. This was, um, they were posting their Bitcoin address. And again, they would say, donate safely and securely with Bitcoin, which may be a bit of an, uh, uh, an overstatement, not sure how secure and, and, and safe it was because you could actually look at the transactions. But again, this was their, um, this was their method of trying to raise funds. Now, they, they initially asked for $750. Now, this was the worth of Bitcoin. This was in 2017. And when we looked at it, we noticed within a span of a week, of a few weeks, they earned about, I think it was around $600 worth of Bitcoin through a few transactions. The thing is, this was the, during the spike in the rise of Bitcoin. So eventually, a few days later, that $600 was worth $800. So you could say that that small campaign from their perspective may have been successful. They were able to take, those, uh, take that Bitcoin and they moved it to another wallet. So the thing I point out is that What's different about crypto, uh, I'm sorry, terrorist fundraising in crypto compared to years before of terrorist fundraising is that you could shine a light on this, but the campaigns would still continue. I, I, post, I wrote an article about this uh, at the time. Even the Wall Street Journal that even uh, did, uh, did an, uh, sort of a, a, a deep dive into this campaign even contacted the Al Sadaqa um, Telegram folks and interviewed them. So they were in the Wall Street Journal. If, this, if we were talking about terrorist fundraising years ago, um, public awareness of the campaign means that it would stop. But with because of the nature of Bitcoin, the campaign still kept going. Um, they kept posting. Um, and they weren't just focused on crypto. They also asked for other ways, uh, other ways of, of doing um, transactions. And so, so we showed this from their, from their cryptocurrency uh, from their Telegram channel. And so, you know, they, here's the thing, the group actually encouraged um, uh, and, and provided different ways for people to, to, to um, or, or try to teach people different ways to get Bitcoin through Bitcoin ATMs, through uh, game vouchers, a lot of different ways. And then the thing is, other groups followed suit. We noticed later uh, in 2018, this group called Mal uh, Malhama Tactical, which is a sort of like a, a, a group that trains uh, uh, jihadist fighters in Syria. Uh, they also posted 
asking for Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin payments. So it's interesting because I often point out that most of these campaigns are relatively unsuccessful. But the point is that though they may not raise as much money, right? Think about the Jahazona campaign, which just raised a few hundred dollars um, or just, you know, $700, $800 in El Sadaka. And even though they continue fundraising, often they don't get many transactions. But the thing is, we notice, one, they seek more uh, over time. I've noticed these groups go beyond Bitcoin and seek privacy coins. They provide tutorials. And moving to custodial to not, from custodial to non-custodial wallets, and we'll break that down. Again, here's a deep dive into that Al-Qasim Brigades, the Hamas campaign. And as Hans mentioned, first they had one type of address. Now here's later on what their campaign looked like. If you look at the, 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 um, the graphic on the right, there is, um, they posted a video which explained, which sort of was a tutorial for how to try to purchase cryptocurrency anonymously so that you could send it, so that you could get it anonymously. And then they provided a little spot in the bottom with, uh, it said, I'm not a robot, you click on that, and then it would provide you that unique Bitcoin address that you could then um, donate to. So instead of having one address, there would be multiple addresses, hundreds or, or more, that would be difficult for law enforcement to track and difficult for us to trace. You'd have to do a little bit more work to try to tie together those transactions. And I'll say on this in terms of, you know, uh, what is a non-custodial wallet? Basically, we're talking about software that you can download that you don't need to go through a, an exchange. You don't have to go to a business that's going to charge you to sign up. You can download the software. Um, and this is for anyone, right? This is not just, uh, you know, something that a terrorist uh, is going to use. This is software that's available. I'm putting up one, this is one such wallet out there, a Samurai, Samurai wallet. And they market themselves as a, a software to help you evade blockchain surveillance. The analysis that happens on the blockchain, well, they are answering that with, uh, with technology that will allow you to, as they say, be your own Swiss bank, right? The idea of a very private way for you to move with no email address, no ID checks. You simply download the software and then you can hold cryptocurrencies in, a, in such a wallet, right? And again, uh, a lot of this comes because there's a strong leaning and a push for privacy. There's this uh, strong sentiment about privacy protection and, and anonymity, as as Hans said. You know, idea ideology masked as uh, um, as as technology, uh, and, and so it's open source. This technology is going to be available, and we'll touch on what that means. So, the Jahazona address still available years years later. Um, uh, you know, even, and the, the money is, this is misleading because there seems to be more money, but that money is simply for the, um, because the price of Bitcoin had, had rise. I want to mention Monero. Now this is a screenshot because one of these groups I looked at eventually had a Monero address. And at the time I said, okay, this is good for our research. They put out the Monero address. We copied it. And let's go to a blockchain browser where you put in the address and let's see what we can find in Monero. And this is a screenshot of exactly what came up. It says, uh, for a moment, we thought you were trying to peek into this Monero address. Hmm, looks like you were trying to check out this dude's balance. Well, Monero says no. So the Monero as a software does not allow you to see the history of transactions. You can confirm that that address exists. You can't see the history. You can't see uh, what is in that address. So it was a bit of a dead end for me as a researcher looking into this. So this is why I think two ecosystems are developing in crypto. I, I, I say that you have the underground, which is well, actually, let me talk about the above ground. Crypto as an industry is actually getting more legitimate, more formal. That's the paved road. More exchanges, more institutional money and investment. Uh, that's growing. More, uh, uh, more compliance but you still have this sort of underground road. You're gonna have the underground ecosystem, which has anonymity, privacy coins, mixers, tumblers, unregulated exchange, decentralized exchanges. So you have two ecosystems developing. Now the, the above ground is probably going to be bigger. It's gonna have more money, but the underground ecosystem will exist, particularly because we have an environment where the idea is to, if technolo with technologists, to move fast and break things. So to create tools and systems before maybe regulations can keep up. But here's the saving grace in the short term. 
we know that we deaf people need to cash out. That's one of the reasons why the, the regulatory approach has been on the off ramps, the on and off ramps into the crypto ecosystem. If you focus on the exchanges with regulatory compliance, then eventually you will get the terrorists, the sanction uh, evaders, um, the money launderers, because they all want to get into regular fiat cash currency. So that has been the sort of saving grace that limits um, the movement of these uh, illicit actors. But the point for the future is that we're getting more digital. Um, there are now systems being built that will have a crypto ecosystem more developed so that perhaps there's gonna be a world where the, you don't need to necessarily cash out because if you can use your crypto for goods and services, then um, you have an ecosystem that really gets potentially bigger and there's less need for someone to cash out, especially if you could do those purchases with anonymous cryptocurrencies. Now that's a regulatory issue that goes into the future that I think will, that regulators are going to need to think about. I'm going to just leave that there, but that's something to think about. If merchants are accepting crypto, what are the risks if they're always accepting, if they're potentially accepting anonymous crypto that can't be um, attributed uh, to, to a particular user? So I'll end with a look forward. And uh, there are a couple of things that are happening um, that uh, I, I want people to think about. Different types of exchanges are being developed. The more we actually have the formalized sector um, develop and grow, the more, and we have FATF um, providing guidance and jurisdictions implementing compliance and oversight for the crypto industry, you still have this underground developing new tools that don't really fit into the regulatory approach the regulatory, fr regulatory framework. Now, these are all um, sort of innovations that are niche, haven't become mainstream, but they are um, something to keep an eye on. So decentralized exchanges, things like lightning channels, where money is, they're sort of off chain, they go to, from a different chain and exchange funds, and then go back onto the blockchain. Privacy coins, which aren't, uh, haven't scaled yet, uh, but, uh, you know, again, there are other, even outside of the Monero and the Dashes and the Zcashes, there are new blockchains being developed that protect privacy. And one thing I'll mention is that um, some people don't realize that there are people working on making Bitcoin more anonymous. The Bitcoin, remember, this is open source software that developers are always working out the bugs. They can provide a new a blockchain uh, protocol. They can update the code. And there are people working to make Bitcoin more anonymous. So that's something to think about for the future, for the next few years. This is open source, open source, open source software that can just be downloaded, right? So I, 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 it's important for people to think about this because the technological uh, challenge is that this is not this is not something that you can always interdict. So this is something that's going to be, uh, I think, in the financial landscape, uh, as, as, especially as we have more innovation. And of course, we point to this, this is not a, 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 a terrorist crowdfunding example, but it should be clear, right? Anyone can create a digital currency now, right? So that just means it's much more easier to create a token, um, to do fundraising, um, so, that, so we should keep that in mind. Uh, I'll end with this thought. Even though the examples I've shown have, have mostly been about crowdfunding, that gets the most attention, that's what is gonna be public. I would say that other uses, particularly laundering, without necessarily fundraising. So let's say you do fundraising through, regular, through banking or through um, you know, uh, you know, some other method, just private donations. Once you have that money, um, what, what I'm concerned about is that uh, illicit actors like terrorists are probably going to simply use the, 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 the placement, the layering and placement uh, um, uh, action as a way to obfuscate the trail of funds and then cash it out elsewhere. So even though we focus on crowdfunding, it's the most, uh, you know, seems to be the most interesting. We look at that and we say not that much money is, is exchanging hands. But if we can think about um, what may be more of interest to illicit actors, it may simply just be the moving of money that's already illicit, not necessarily the raising of money, something to keep in mind. And the last feature uh, I'll touch on, which, which we don't think that much about, but, but this is something I've been thinking about for a few years. Um, the technology, the decentralized technology serves other functions besides just simple value transfer. Um, there's also the idea of decentralized servers 
so that you could have media content, which is decentralized. I mean, I've, I've gone to conferences and I've, you know, talked to, there are lots of people working on decentralized platforms for legitimate purposes. Some people are looking for uh, a media which may be unbiased and for freedom of speech. Um, but it's, it's important to note that this technology, the same blockchain technology, which allows a decentralized data structure and data verification structure, um, that there are also efforts to create um, content that could be hosted through in a decentralized means. So what does it, what does it mean if we move from a world where, you know, a propaganda, a, a jihadist propagandist or a right wing extremist, violent extremist usually would post on YouTube and then YouTube would take that down or on, you know, Facebook or, um, you know, some other platform, Twitter, you, you have a centralized uh, source to go to, 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 make, to make them take that down. What does the world look like if a jihadist group can post beheading videos on a platform that is decentralized that does not really have a, comp a particular company that manages um, the content and those servers? There are tools and platforms being developed. And this is what I would point to. I don't have an answer for how do we address that. I mean, there are lots of issues that we have to sort of unpack and work through. But the decentralized, the, this growth in decentralized media is going to provide some challenges. And we're going to have to um, think through that through, uh, in terms of the re regulatory framework and, and, um, and even exactly just how do we, how, as, a, as a society, how do we address these challenges? And what are going to be the pros and costs in terms of privacy, compliance, law enforcement, security, freedom of speech, and the like? So in the end, um, the illicit actors, no matter what type, are playing, uh, you know, a bit of a, we're playing a cat and mouse game. This is a bit of a, a chess match. And so we're going to have to simply be ahead of the game. Um, and, and, and not only, and I think the, the, what the good that we're seeing is that we're seeing regulators take this on. We're seeing regulators get more educated in this technology. Um, but the illicit actors are doing, you know, they're continuing to innovate. So I will end here and feel free. I'll just provide a few links if you, if you want to hear more. I have articles on, uh, on my website, cryptocurrencyaml.com. I frequently post in, in Forbes, have articles in Forbes, and you can follow me on these, uh, these channels. Happy to share more. Um, happy to share more, and I'm looking forward to our discussion.